All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On the show with me today, we have a special guest, Dr. Nicholas Dogris. Dr. Dogris is the CEO and co-founder of Neurofield, Inc., a company that develops specialized neurostimulation and neurofeedback modalities designed to restore functionality to the brain. He's a licensed psychologist in the state of California and specializes in health psychology, wellness, and mind-body physiology. Over the last 25 years, Dr. Dogris has innovated many neurofeedback interventions and invented the Neurofield Neurostimulation Neuromodulation System in 2007. Dr. Dogris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So tell me, how in the world did you get into this, this kind of specific field? What originally kind of drew you in? Um, wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, in my graduate school days in 1987, that's kind of hard to say out loud, um, I attended Humboldt State University, and um, at that time, I engaged in my uh, beginning of my career in EEG research, and so uh, I was introduced to Dr. John Morgan and Dr. James Knight, um, both of which um, were researchers there at the um, psychology department at Humboldt State. <clears throat> Dr. Knight was big on um, the philosophy of consciousness and, he, and taught us all sorts of stuff about uh, the research associated with consciousness and gestalt psychology. And he was a NASA trained psychologist, really just amazingly intelligent individual that gave us a well-rounded education about what we perceive. Um, and Dr. Morgan was the, uh, he was the EEG guy. He was doing research in EEGs way back in the day and um, introduced me to um, uh, event-related potentials uh, back at that time. And I remember sitting in his class and he was saying, well, you know, we can measure the human brain in this way and we can time lock an event and then give that time locked event to the person multiple times and then we can and start making some statements about the way the brain fires and where it fires and and what happens essentially um, that was really interesting to me uh, at the time i had graduated with my bachelor's degree in in, uh, in applied psychology and i had the intention of actually uh, becoming a nasa psychologist and so when i was looking at universities i saw that dr knight was a retired NASA psychologist and I talked to him about it and he said well if you're interested I still know people and you know we can write letters and you know you just attend our program and get your master's degree and then we'll shoot you off over to NASA and I thought that's a good idea and so um, that's, that's what kind of drew me into it but then once I got into the spirit of their program and their education it just fit me you know, I've always been a musician. Uh, I've always uh, thought of the brain as kind of like a musical instrument. And when Dr. Morgan showed me some of the initial things about the way, you know, the brain runs frequency ranges and it can, you know, can create all these different kinds of band, frequency bands at the same time, uh, that was intriguing to me. And uh, I imagined being able to uh, work with the brain at that time thinking wow there, there's probably some really good ways of being able to heal the brain a la kind of like star trek you know uh, uh ways to be able to use frequency to heal and that's what kind of started me and then what uh do you remember kind of when you first heard about like transcranial stimulation or pemf some of these different technologies that you've ended up incorporating into neurofield i um uh, well, yeah, I, I started researching stimulation um, before the birth of my son in 2002. I've you know, been trained in neurofeedback uh, for 12 years in the, at that point, doing EEG neurofeedback. I had heard about um, the replacement for electroconvulsive therapy, which was repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. 
um, developed by Anthony Barker in the UK back in uh, the 90s, actually the 80s. And uh, it was a you know, less invasive method that didn't cause a seizure and it could help people with you know, profound depression. I was very interested in that. Um, and, um, but I had never gone into it deeply until, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, basically. And so when my son was born, he was born hypoxic and suffered from a, um, a brain injury as a result. Um, and at that point, I thought, you know, I, I needed a way to be able to rehabilitate his brain. I had worked with a lot of people over the 12 year period doing neurofeedback. And I knew from my experience of working with children that it would take longer to be able to rehabilitate somebody um, when their injury is multiple years out from the original event. And, you know, to train somebody in neurofeedback, the kid's got to be at least five or six years old. And it, it's difficult to be able to do that. So I, um, started looking into uh, electromagnetic stimulation. And that's when I saw Barker's work on TMS, but that was far too aggressive to be able to use on a baby. So then I started looking into, is it possible to use something on the very low end? And uh, in, in what I mean by low end, low intensity stimulation. And that's when I found the low intensity neurofeedback system, which was called the LENS. Um, I utilized the lens for a couple of years and it did have clinical utility with my son. It helped him uh, significantly to, uh, to start to get better. Um, but we plateaued with the system because there was only a certain amount of output that you could get out of it. And at that point, I realized that um, I needed something more uh, intensive. And that's why I developed uh, the electromagnetic system. Can you tell me the uh, and tell our listeners the story of of kind of meeting Brad, um, your your tech guy? Because I thought it was just such a cool way that that sort of came about. <laughs> yeah, uh, magical. If I, I guess that's the way you could describe it, huh? Again, you know, I, there's no accidents. First, you know, stuff happens, and I, I think it's uh, it's interesting the way we manifest our energy. And I've always been interested in. Um, uh, a person's innate ability to create things. Uh, and there's, there's a law of intention uh, where you can manifest uh, uh, your thoughts in, in, along with feeling uh, to create some kind of reality, essentially. And uh, I was watching a movie called The Secret and I saw Reverend Beckwith on the movie and he said, uh, you can create whatever you want, just you know, just say it as if you already have it and then couple it with the feeling of love and, uh, and then it'll become a reality if you just kind of keep focusing on it enough. So uh, I thought, well, okay, I met a radio frequency engineer and him and I, uh, you know, create this device that changes the world. And then I thought about my son. And so it was pretty easy to couple all that together. Uh, and then two days later, I was getting a guitar lesson and uh, my lesson ended. And the next student walked in and he said, uh, what's your name? And I said, my name's Nick. And what's your name? My name's Brad. What do you do? And I said, I'm a psychologist. And what do you do? He goes, I'm a radio frequency engineer. And, uh, and I kind of, I felt time stop for a moment. It was trippy. Um, but it was, it was really cool. And I, I had the, um, the vision of what I needed. I needed a four channel frequency generator that could do yada, yada, yada. So I told him and he said, oh, that's easy. I can make that. And he said, what do you suppose you could treat? And I said, well, I think we can help kids with autism. And he said, that's interesting because I have an autistic son. And so 30 days later, we had the first prototype, which he built by hand. And then um, six months later, uh, we tested 10 units with licensed professionals to see whether or not we actually had something that could impact the brain and provoke the brain into a state where it would uh, begin to regenerate and heal itself. We developed a three milligauss device, which is really, really low intensity. I mean, you get far more electromagnetic stimulation when you stick your head in the refrigerator than when you turn this thing on at full power. We didn't know if it would do anything. So we ran a, a, a study with 21 subjects and we took a 
EEG uh, with each one of them. And then we gave them 100 seconds of stimulation with this three milligauss device. And then we took an immediate EEG post and we did a comparison on the groups. And um, we didn't find any group differences. And I remember looking at the data thinking, gosh, I really thought we had something. You know, I thought that was, you know, we were going to see something. Well, you know, when you have a system that has roughly seven quadrillion events happening per second, it's pretty likely that these events are going to happen differently per system. And the odds of them actually lining up are, are, are at such a low level are, are you know, pretty low. And so uh, when I looked at the data and I looked at each subject individually, it turned out that 100% of the sample had significant changes in their brain within that 100 second period of time. They just all changed differently. So we found something and we found it in 100% of the sample. So we were convinced that you, know, you could turn this thing on and it wouldn't create heat and it wouldn't cause any form of cellular death uh, because it was so low level. Um, you're being bombarded with more than three milligauss right now. Um, the trick was being able to be able to, f to focus it in a frequency, in a band that the brain could recognize. So that's what we did. And something particularly interesting, I think I, I remember you you saying one time, is that you you weren't originally intending to to develop Neurofield as like this commercial technology, right? It was it was started just you know solely to try to help your your son, correct? And then that's you, correct. Yeah. So so tell me a little about kind of what sort of took it from that in order in and sort of. Uh, kind of inspired you to, to want to actually develop it into a commercial product? Um, guilt, uh, probably, no. Um, at the time, I was getting my board certification in, in uh, quantitative EEG, and my mentor uh, was Corden Hammond. Uh, Corey Hammond wrote the Red Book of Clinical Hypnosis. He was one of Milton Erickson, Erickson's uh, um, students. Uh, he worked at the uh, Utah uh, University School of Medicine as one of their premier psychologists. He, uh, he was a big guy in the, in the field of, of neurofeedback and, and uh, hypnosis. And uh, Corey, um, I had told Corey about what I had been working on, and he was um, very interested. I, I put a unit in his hands and said, this is what I'm doing. What do you think? And he ran some field studies on it and came back to me a couple of months later and basically said, um, I understand why you did this, but you don't have the option of uh, just kind of shelving it at this point. Because if you do, it's really just an unethical act if you do that. You have the ethical obligation to release this to the world. Um, and I just kind of went, I felt my... I remember feeling my heart just kind of sink because it's such a mag, you know, just a, it's a big project. And I, I had no intention of engaging in a big project like this. I just wanted to, you know, hang out in the Eastern Sierra and pluck my guitar and, you know, and not do a whole lot other than that than work, you know, and be a, a parent. And, um, well, you know, Corey changed my mind in that regard. So I released it. And I wanted to ask kind of like what it's the sort of challenges, you know, I think one thing that's, that's uh, particularly interesting about you is that you're both, you know, a successful clinician along with a businessman that you've been able to sort of merge the, the two together. And I just wanted to kind of hear how, like some of the challenges that, that you sort of faced and, and been able to overcome just in, in the process of developing it into a commercial product. Yeah. Wow, yeah, it's a, a lot of challenges. Um, I think one of the things that is really important to acknowledge is that when people get clinical training, they really get clinical training and they don't get business training. So doctors tend to be very poor businessmen and women. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't run their, their businesses in a way where, uh, you know, 
they, the, it's, it's financially profitable and ethical. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen this time and time again. And I was really fortunate um, over the years, especially in the early 90s, I met some people that were uh, clinicians that were just wonderful business people. And, um, and they stayed up on, uh, on marketing techniques and business techniques on how you run an ethical practice, how do you generate revenue appropriately, um, how do you scale, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I was encouraged to, uh, to learn these things as I went up through the years getting my bachelor's degree. You know, I, I started learning about these things. I was lucky uh, early on. Uh, in my early 20s, just starting to get an idea. I've, I've always had entrepreneurial blood in me because I've, I've run other businesses and, and, and did other projects uh, on my own. And uh, I enjoyed being my own boss in many ways, simply so I can make the calls and make stuff happen. And I think there, there's, a, there's so many different things to learn about that. But one of them is get good business training. Uh, if you're going to become a clinician or anything, really. I mean, uh, but some of the challenges were, you know, uh, I had never owned a company before where you're developing a piece of hardware and you're manufacturing some stuff. And, you know, what does that look like? Um, and how do you do it and meet the safety guidelines, uh, you know, that are, you know, um, uh, dictated by the FDA? And, you know, what does that look like? And it's an arduous process. It's a big process. It's daunting. It's not made for the little guy, that's for sure. Um, and then I, we went through a lot of iterations, a lot of prototypes, spent a lot of money over the years um, uh, learning how to do that process. Now we're pretty good at it, I can say, um, after 12 years later. But at the beginning, we made a lot of mistakes because we didn't understand um, uh, some of the rules and even though we had some consultants they weren't that great and you know getting people that know uh, uh, what they're doing in the field and understanding that is, is not as easy as it sounds um, I always have people come to me and say oh, I'm gonna make a product and I'm gonna do what you did I'm gonna do that I'm like good luck you know step in love to see it you know and it's uh, I don't think people really understand what it means to to do something like that and what it takes um, yeah, but it's it's extremely challenging from from production to software development to um, how do you market these things appropriately? Um, who do you sell them to? Um, you know, what claims do you make? Uh, all those things are really important. Um, so that you know, I'm I'm de I've dedicated my life to this process. Really, I started you know when I was 21, I'm 55 now. Uh, and, um, you know, it's my intention to go as long as I can muster the strength. Uh, but the whole point is to push the field forward so that we can create more devices like this and encourage other people to do so for the purpose of, um, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitation and, and regulation of the brain. Uh, th these are far more effective methods than other methods out there. Awesome. I wanted to switch gears a little bit. You know, I know with even with how busy you are, you still make time to to comb through a lot of the the research, the new neuroscience research. And I wanted to just hear if there's anything recently that you've been particularly intrigued by, any recent findings that that have particularly caught your eye. Um, you know, I've been uh, I circled back to the event related potentials. Um, I start, you know, about a year and a half ago, I want to say about that, um, I, I started really getting into computational neuroscience and looking at machine learning. And um, the people down at UC San Diego, the Swartz Center for Computational Neuroscience, have developed a little program called EEG Lab. And EEG Lab was originally designed for ERP research, which allows you to time lock an event and look at the positive and negative potentials that are created as a result of this time locked event. And um, the science now is is really sophisticated. It much it's much, it's galaxies away from where it was when I first started. 
Um, but you can you can create these events in the brain and then you can spatially locate them in a three-dimensional space. And when you find them, then you can look at the temporal resolution of these sources. So you can look at the frequency bands. And then you can look at the flow of energy and the connectivity between these sources. And so, for instance, if you have a visual stimulus and it travels you know, through your eyes to the thalamus and it makes it to the visual cortex, we know how long that's gonna take. It's roughly 100 milliseconds. Uh, from there, it's gonna be projected out to the precuneus and the visual association areas. And then there, if it's gonna also be uh, um, sent to auditory areas, it's gonna be sent to the motor strip. And then finally, all of that's gonna get sent to the, motor, uh, to the frontal lobe. And, 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 you, and, and you, know, you can see how the system's actually gonna light up and fire off. Now, over the last 30 years, there's been a huge amount of research that's been done in this area, primarily research level. Um, and some clinical, um, but I'm really interested in applying it to clinical problems like ADHD and depression and traumatic brain injury. And that's what we've been doing for the last year and a half. And uh, now I have a, a pretty stout uh, assessment system that can look at these latencies and reaction times, gives you an idea of where the system is, is, is running at the speeds it's supposed to and then where it's not. So it's really cool because when you find where it's not running correctly, then you can use these neurostimulation methods that we've been developing to help the brain to fire appropriately and pick up the space, or you know, so it can go faster. And, and that, where, that, that, that translates to better functioning, basically. Right. And we're, I, I kind of wanted to wrap up by, by sort of hearing your take on like where you see kind of the field of, of, you know, neurostimulation or neuromodulation in general, like, do you see it kind of, you know, becoming this, this thing that people just have neurofeedback machines in their houses and like, it's just really ubiquitous or do you still see it in the future still kind of this specialized uh, practice? I see both. Um, you know, it, there still needs to be a, more research and more development, obviously. Um, it's, it, there needs to be a lot of work done on, um, you know, the way the brain works and how to actually stimulate it. Um, and, you know, doing it willy nilly on your own, that's possible, but the, the, the type of outcomes and, and that you're gonna get are gonna be variable. You know, assessment of the system is really key. And that's part of the things, you know, we're working on now. But I think there's gonna be more, the direction we're pushing now is really heavily into the, the clinical assessment and clinical use of these kinds of devices with people with appropriate training uh, that can utilize this and, and carry it forward. And eventually, yeah, I could see a home system being devised where the home user could apply. It's not that tough for a person to be able to give themselves a neurostimulation. Uh, even now, it's not that tough. It's really knowing what to do and where to do it. That's the key and how long to do it. So, you know, you can buy a bottle of Tylenol, uh, but without the instructions on the bottle, you know, you don't know how much you're supposed to take, right? And so that's, that's part of what needs to be done here, you know, to solidify this. And of course, you know, a lot further research needs to be done to really uh, understand the nature of these different kinds of pathology. So it's an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing process. Awesome. Well, it's a good, uh, good battle you're fighting. Um, you. So for people who are, who are interested and want to learn more about your work or learn more about Neurofield, where would you direct them to? Neurofield.com. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's Easy enough. Go check out Neurofield.com. Uh, our website has uh, information about uh, the devices that we've developed. Also, uh, if you're interested in the education of neurotherapy, go visit uh, schoolofneurotherapy.com, www.schoolofneurotherapy.com. Um, that's where you can get online education for board certification in neurotherapy and in quantitative EEG and in neurofield. And then lastly, uh, our clinic here in Santa Barbara, which is uh, neurofieldneurotherapy.com. So awesome. all of those are online resources. Great.
And for those of you guys who enjoyed the show, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're Roscoe's Wetsuit. And you can also find audio versions of the podcast available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and we're now on Stitcher. So go ahead, uh, check us out whichever way you want. Dr. Dogris, it was a pleasure having you on today. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely.